Yes. I had set out my stall as to where I was going to go before the short adjournment let me now yes. go there. Um, part one is Grand Three, which I agree with George is the main event. Uh, two couple of preliminary points here. Um, in terms of the principles that fall to be applied when deciding whether a duty of care is owed, the judge undertook a summary of those principles in his judgment from paragraphs 50 to 62. I needn't take you to them because I just ask you to note that it is not said that uh, he has misdirected himself as to the legal principles as far as they relate to questions of duty of care. Similarly, the judge says in paragraph 11 that he takes the facts as set out in the particulars of claim and he includes a summary from paragraph 12 onwards. And again, the only thing I need to say there is that it is not said that he mischaracterised or overlooked one of the facts upon which the appellant's pleaded duty of care case was based. So really the only issue for this court under Grand 3 is whether on the facts alleged in the amended particulars of claim, it is properly arguable as a matter of law that a duty of care was owed by the respondent to the appellant. And the ultimate question is, is he right or is he wrong? Yes, I think it's implicit in what you've just said, that you, you submit <coughs> that although it's right to formulate it as it reasonably arguable, it is in fact a binary question. It, it really is, because we've got, a, we've got facts that are um, accepted for the purposes of summary judgment. As the judge rightly notes, they're pretty straightforward facts, um, and uh, the court simply has to grasp the nettle, as it were, and decide whether that is a uh, produces a, a duty of, of care. As far as duty of care is concerned, it's right to identify that there are three different kinds of duty that the appellant has variously identified across her pleadings, or rather the amended particulars of claim, her skeletons and her oral submissions. And they are these. One, uh, the appellant argues that the respondent owed a duty to take care in the recruitment and supervision uh, of management staff. Uh, two, the respondent... So tr recruitment and supervision of... Management staff, specifically the managing agent. Yeah. But I think, that in fairness, the appellant would say that that follows all the way down to... Um, uh, to, to, to other, other people. But at any rate, it's, it's the respondent owing a duty to take care when it, it recruits management, its managing agent, and supervises it. The second duty is uh, a duty to take reasonable care of the keys which had been entrusted to the porters acting as the respondent's agent and thus entrusted to the respondent as principal. Hang on one second. And, and thirdly, a, a duty which boils down to a duty to ensure that the porters in the building perform their own functions with reasonable skill and care. That latter duty being predicated not on the supposition that the porters are the respondent's agent, but on the contractual context and the circumstances more widely. 
I'm not going to say much about the duty to exercise skill and care in recruitment and supervision because I'm going to deal with that in my respondent's notice point in part three, but I am going to take uh, a closer look at the uh, second and third duties, starting with the duty of care based on the porters being the respondent's agent. Um, and, and I start with some first principles of a rather basic kind. The, the law of tort does not rest generally on the concept of agency. It performs only a more limited role in the, uh, uh, in the law of tort. The way in which the law of tort essentially works is that the party who commits the wrongful act is personally liable if he has an employer uh, if the person who commits the wrongful act has an employer there is a uh, and it's done in the course of his his duties as employee there is a parallel duty or a parallel liability which arises by virtue of vicarious liability uh, and is imposed on the employer. You may have deeper pockets. I think you're right to correct yourself. Vicarious liability doesn't rest on there being a duty owed by the employer. It rests on there being a duty owed by the employee for which the employer is made liable. Yes, that is, that, that is um, correct. The fact that the wrongdoer may be an independent contractor when they commit the tortious act, if you're performing a contractual obligation to someone else, it is generally speaking irrelevant in the law of tort, which as I've already identified, focuses on the person who actually commits the tortious act and imposes a parallel liability on their employer, regardless of duty. And the basic principle which has been explored ad nauseam in the authorities is subject to certain limited exceptions which don't apply here, not said to apply here. The uh, uh, a party is not liable for the torts of their independent contractor. But I accept. Sorry, I just wanted the structure of this. You said the fact that the wrongdoer may be an independent contractor when they do the wrongful act is generally irrelevant in the law of tort. Yes, because it is the wrongdoer who is personally liable. The claimant can sue the employer who is vicariously liable for his employee's wrongful act. But if there is no employer and the wrongdoer is simply an independent contractor of someone else, then the law of tort, generally speaking, does not offer a, um, the ability to sue that other person simply because they were in a contractual relationship with the party who commits the tortious act. That's well, is, is this... Is, I... So the role of the concept of independent contractor is as a um, limit to or parameter of the concept of vicarious liability. Is that right? Well, they're, all, they're generally speaking uh, alternatives. Sorry, this is very basic stuff and I'm very conscious I may be wrong in how I'm thinking about it. Alternatives in what way? Well, um, if, if A employs B to perform a task, B does it badly, commits a tort, um, a, a, a B is, is, is the primary party yeah, liable in tort. That, yes. uh, a, as the employer, is liable. And you're talking about employer in the sense of contract of service? Yes, yeah. in, in, in general terms. He is liable because he is the employer of yeah. B, and B was acting in the ordinary course of his. Yeah, so that's classic vicarious liability. That's, that's classic. 
But also equally classic is uh, the proposition that if A um, merely contracts with B to go along and perform some function, so he's not the employer, yeah. and B, whilst he is doing A's work, doing the job that A has asked him to do, yeah. contracted with him to do, there is no liability that arises in tort, and, and that is why one has all of the large body of jurisprudence working about working out when somebody is their employer, whether they're acting in the course of their ordinary yeah. duties. Um, which is why we had the Supreme Court um, recently explaining the limits of the exception to that, where it, whereas you may have, in some circumstances, that um, a, a party is not strictly, technically, an employee, but is acting uh, in all respects in a, a situation which is so similar to a relationship of employment that the uh, uh, that the law treats them as being effectively an employee for the purposes of establishing vicarious liability, and there are all those um, uh, uh, horrible sexual abuse cases where yeah. the uh, courts have uh, uh, grappled with and um, and been prepared in those circumstances to extend the principle, which is uh, to to offer an exception to the starting premise, which is generally speaking, you are only indirectly liable, vicariously liable for. Uh, the torts of your employee. Are you referring to, when you say limited exceptions in jurisprudence, do you mean cases like Arms and Nottingham? Uh, I mean it's... Council about foster carers who are not employees, but yes. or, are or, fulfilling a statutory function as companion yes. counsel in looking after the children. They're not strictly speaking. Uh, the Supreme Court has recently... Um, the name has popped out of my head. It's in my skeleton. Perhaps somebody behind me will get it for you. It's not the Barclays Bank case, but the doctor. Th that, that was the next one. This is the latest in the learning. This one is called X, and I'll get the reference for you. Um, it's in my skeleton below, actually. Is it a question of whether they're part of the organisation? Yes, it's whether they are effectively part of the organisation. Business and phrase is sometimes said. Sorry. Another way, another way it's put, I think, is which I think is the same concept as my lords. Whether the uh, the actual tort fees are is conducting a business of their own. These are all similar sorts of concepts, aren't they? Similar sorts of concepts, but they operate by way of limited exception to the general rule that yes. A is not liable for B his independent contractors' torts. And in this case, uh, vicarious liability was conceded before yes. the judge. Yes, it was originally advanced. That analysis, even if it might theoretically apply, yes, by the bar. And that's why we had in my um, skeleton argument below uh, arguments about how vicarious liability works. It's the, the latest in the learning is the Supreme Court's decision in Trustees of Barry. Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses versus BXB, 2023, uh, UK Supreme Court, page 15, is the most recent and authoritative, but it takes into account Barclays Bank and all of those other decisions that Shaw Lordships have kindly uh, reminded me of. Um, so that, and that's a really important starting point, and it is, and I don't want to get um, entirely blown, of course, but it is the answer to my learned friends. Well, these are all people in contractual relationships, and everything that mm. uh, that um, the porters do is ultimately because when one feeds back across the contractual chain, they were put in motion by the uh, respondent who he would say, I disagree with him on this, um, sits at the beginning of the chain. Um, but that's not how the law of talk works. But let me explain how it does come into, agency to... does come into talk. Okay. okay yes. uh, it's, it's not the touchstone, uh, vicarious liability is, of indirect liability, but it can operate in this way, and I do accept 
that it is perfectly possible for A to acquire a duty of care because of action taken by B, its agent, in A's name. So that when you are looking at the circumstances that give rise to a duty of care, an agent, a, a properly authorised agent, who is be effectively is a cipher for A, um, could result in a duty of care being acquired by the principal. And the second way in which I also accept that agency comes into the reckoning is um, if a duty of care is owed by A and he asks his agent B to perform the functions that that duty entails, and B does a bad job, um, A will be in breach and he can't hide behind the fact that B was his agent. Uh, are those two points? They're just one point, aren't they? No. Uh, one is about whether the duty of care arises in the first place. Uh, the first is whether things that are said and done by B, let, let, let me um, stop being theoretical and, and bring it into the, the facts of our case, it may be more helpful. Um, if the porters, when they agreed to take custody of the appellant's keys and look after them and only give them back to the appellant, were acting as the respondent's agent in so doing, then I would accept that on, on that, in that scenario, that would be sufficient to give rise to an assumption of responsibility type duty of care, because what the, uh, all that the agent has done is to do things which the law treats as being done by the respondent itself. Um, what, what, what's the distinction? How would the porters, when exercising this particular function, be recognised as doing it as the respondent's agent? Well, suppose and not. Um, it, otherwise, I mean, agency is classically about creating contractual relations between A and B, but we're not talking about a contract here. Of course, if we talk about a contract, if there was an actual contract, if the porter said, in return for some consideration, I will look after your key, and it was clear they were doing that on behalf of the, 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 the defendant, well, that's fine, but we're not in that territory. We're, and I don't quite understand in what sense they would be doing as agent, and yet otherwise than entering into a contract. Well, um, in some respects, if, you, if you're if you not with me on, on that, that, that helps me because I'm ultimately looking to derail the case that's based on agency. But so, suppose for a, for a moment that the landlord is sat in his office and says to the porter, I really ought to have a copy of um, Flat 3's key. Could you go and say, I would like it? Um, I and can, you'll can I and I'll look after, after it. it and I'll only give it back to you and then the porter goes down and says the landlord would like over your key um, and it's handed over in those circumstances well, I would access yeah. okay. uh, that what the porter is doing there is um, acting in the name of the landlord in circumstances which might give rise to an assumption of responsibility type duty of care Another example might be sometimes when porters hold keys, they get the tenant to set out a list of everybody who is entitled to borrow the key for access to the flat. And if that list had the name of the landlord at the top, it would be very easy to say that porters had accepted the key on behalf of the landlord. Yes, I, I think I would probably um, accept that. But it is this sort of realm that we're in where um, the duty comes about because of something that is done by the porters, but it, it is done in circumstances where they are the um, uh, they are doing everything they do in the name of the respondent. They are the respondent as, as as the law regards it as regards them. 
It's, it is as if the landlord had by its very own hands taken custody of the key or put up your lordship's notice because the agent is doing everything that they're doing um, in, in, the name of the, in the name of the landlord. And whether deliberately or by accident, you're using precisely the language that we find in the management agreement. Um, it, it is by accident, but, um, but, but that's, at the moment I'm setting out where I say that agency might be relevant to the question of the imposition of a duty of care. Um, and if in those circumstances that might give rise to the duty of, of care, and of course, if I did owe, and this will, in a sense, st the starting premise for this second point is the question, answering the question that we're here to, um, to answer, which is if there is a duty that's owed by me, the respondent, and I delegate to the porter the activities involved in performing that function, then if the porter loses it, I can be sued because I can't hide behind the agency. That's assuming I already owed a duty of care in my own right. You can't escape your duty of care by asking somebody else to look after the key for you instead, if you take my example of the landlord in his office. Is that because it's a non-delegable duty? Because there's sometimes there's analysis no, about that. My Lord, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't put it that way, it's because uh, in this part of the analysis, one assumes that there's, that A already owes a duty of care, and that duty is to ensure that the key is kept safe and only handed back to um, uh, the appellant. If A says, I owe that duty, but you, B, hang on to this key, uh, then if B hands it to a thief and doesn't look after it, uh, the appellant can sue A because they owe the duty of care and it's not been performed and I can't, I, it's no answer to the claim against A to say, oh, well, I'm terribly sorry I gave it to B and they didn't look after it, so why don't you sue them? As I say, my lord. In a sense, you're making all this point against yourself. You're saying that agency can come in this way, but it doesn't here. Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, if you, were, uh, if you were against me on those two circumstances when agency might have a role to play that would, would be helpful to me, but it's not something that I urge upon you because I don't think that it's right. Uh, and indeed, uh, there is. Is it helpful to look at Bausted's analysis or not really? Um, my Lord, I'll come back to you. I've got... Um, don't worry. Don't take you off uh, it's, your course. It's ba Bausted or... Um, Chitty. Chitty, there is a passage that's referred to in my skeleton argument. There is in Chitty, I didn't, I haven't read uh, in, come uh, to it. Come to it when you're ready, that's fine. So, um, so on the question of agency, uh, if the porters were in fact the respondent's agent, so that they everything they did, it was effectively as though the respondent had done it, uh, and they took custody of the key and therefore the respondents of principal took custody of the key, uh, then I would accept that a responsibility, assumption of responsibility duty of care might arise. But uh, as my Lord indicates, that's not this case. In order to understand why it's not this case, one has to start with the pleadings and the amended particulars of claim And the starting point in the call bundle at page 107 is paragraph 8a where the duty that is alleged at this stage of the pleading is framed. Page 107. Uh, what is said is that under the heading duty of care by the defendant, as a matter of law in providing the relevant services for the benefit of tenants in the building, including the claimant, the defendant owed ten tenants, including the claimant, a duty to take reasonable care. Um, that begs the question what are the relevant services? 
And in order to see that, one has to go back to page 103. I just got behind for a moment. Where, where were you? Um... I was at 107 and yeah. page 8a. Yes. And to make sense of the duty in relation to relevant services, one has to see what the relevant services are. Yes. And one goes back to 103. And one sees that the relevant services at A and B are A, the provision of such staff and equipment as are reasonably necessary to ensure the building is secure. B, the selection and supervision of such staff as were reasonably competent uh, to ensure that the building was secure. A and the simple point here is that at this stage, the type of duty that's being alleged is my respondent's notice duty. It focuses on the things that the respondent does itself, and it's looking at uh, recruitment and supervision. Fair enough. But one then has to look on to see what happens next. And one finds that at page 113, the negligence. Now, before we even read what's there, one might have been expecting to find that breach of the kind of duty that we've just looked at is alleged. Yes, right. The respondent um, uh, was careless in the appointment of its managing agent, um, a fair brother who it knew from its track record um, was uh, uh, wholly unsuitable. That sort of thing. Uh, the respondent failed to supervise the uh, managing agent. There have been incidents like this over the last five years and they've not done anything about it. But th that's not what happens. What one then finds is paragraph 27 is an allegation that the defendant breached the duty of care. Right? Uh, and 31 is where you find what the um, uh, uh, completed particulars of breach are. And, and they are... So uh, which paragraph do you say? Paragraph 31, my lord, yeah. on page yeah. 114. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's a verb, the following acts entail breach of the duty of care owed to the claimant by the defendant's agents. Now, I'm going to come back to that curious phrase in a second, but I would just ask your lordships to note that what is focused on when we come to breach are the activities of the porters on the all-important day in question. No allegations, this is something the judge picks up, of breach of the recruitment and supervision. It's all about the failings of the porters and their handing over the keys to the wrong person. Coming back to the breach of a duty of care owed by the defendant's agents, that is, of course, a legal non sequitur. That is because either the duty is owed by the respondent because of things done by the porters as its agents in its name, or alternatively, the duty of care is indeed owed by the porters, in which case they are personally liable and FSL or APSL as their employers are vicariously liable. But where one can see a more recognisable sort of agency argument is at 26A on page 1112. The claim was advanced both in bailment and in negligence. And indeed, bailment really headlined the claim originally. Uh, at 26A on page 1112, one sees a more orthodox agency argument. At all material times, the defendant acting by its agents, the porters, was the bailey of the keys to the flat. They held the keys on terms and they failed to abide by them. There's one other place, just for completeness, that agency is dealt with, and that is at page 108, <coughs> paragraph 9a. Uh, in response to my Lord Lord Justice Edith's point about uh, vicarious, liability, vicarious liability, here it is. Claim, claimant was relying on the defendant, further alternatively, 
the defendant is vicariously liable for the acts of its agents, the porters. <coughs> so that's how that's how the pleaded case works. But but I, I accept that within the uh, within the pleading as a whole, it doesn't compartmentalise it. Um, there is a, a case advanced that the porters were the respondent's agents when they took custody of the keys and did so in its name. As, as far as the type of agency is concerned, it can be important to understand what, what the origin of the authority being posited uh, is. One finds that at page 107, paragraph 6b, Further, alternatively, the port is acting within the scope of their ostensible authority requested of the claimant when she moved into the flat that she provide them with a set of keys to flat nine. Now, that, to be clear, is the original set of keys, not the new set of keys that was produced when the, uh, when the locks were changed. But if one comes on to uh, page 109... One finds at paragraph 17 going over the page the factual allegation that the new keys were also handed to the porter. Sorry, which paragraph? Paragraph 17. I'm afraid there are a number of paragraph 17, but the one I want is the one that starts at the bottom of page 109. It refers to the installation of the new locks. Uh, and to the fact that two copies of the key uh, were provided to the porter, known only as Sebastian. And then if you go turn over to page 111, paragraph 17a, the allegation is that Sebastian took a copy of the new key from Mr. Mukahar, the appellant's son, and said that he would keep it for the claimant. There is no explanation as to whether that is as to the basis of authority that's being asserted there. But one infers from the fact that the first set of keys was uh, said to have been received as ostensible authority that that is the basis upon which the new key is said to have been received by the porters. In terms of actual authority, the only place that one finds the claimant engaging with the concept of actual authority is at paragraph 2M, C, and E, starting on page 104. And here... Sorry, which page Page is 104, 2M. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 2M, C is the bit that we looked at a moment ago, subject always to this agreement. Mm -hmm. The defendant authorises the agent to act in its name. And on its behalf. And on its behalf. Uh, and then over the page at E, this is the non-delegation provision clause 15, fair brother, you would not delegate any part of its functions without prior written consent of the defendant. And then... It's important to look at paragraph 2.0 on page 105. And actually, it's top of page 106 because it's 2.0b, where the appellant positively pleads uh, the obligations of Fairbrother as agent were non delegable, save by prior written agreement, as far as the claimant is aware, the defendant did not ever permit Fairbrother to delegate the provision of services. And thus, Fairbrother remained at all times uh, material to the current claim, the defendant's authorised agent for the provision of relevant services. Relevant services, of course, a reference back to the recruitment uh, and supervision of authors and everybody else. Hang on one second. I just want to see it again. But that, was, uh... that was 2K at page 103.
So it's the. Well, hang on a second. I'm so sorry. Mm. The services are not defined as they might more straightforwardly have been to hold keys. Hold keys or porterage serve provision procuring satisfactory port of porterage well, I services. I agree, but ultimately you'd have to have a particular of what the relevant porterage services are. Yes. And the act, in an ordinary analysis, the services which the porters, the relevant services which the porters provided was a key holding key service, hold. which basically means looking after someone's key and giving it back to them or, yes. and, uh, on request, them or other people properly authorised by them. Yes. Yeah. But what I would ask your lordships to note here is, as far as actual authority is concerned, the pleaded case that the uh, is that the respondent cloaked Fairbrother with authority to act in its name. Fairbrother was not able to and didn't delegate on the power to bind the respondent Not only do we not find a true chain of agency type argument here, which is the respondent gives Fairbrother the right to bind it, to do things in its name. Fairbrother delegates that authority down to FSL or APSL. And so one or other of those companies can also bind the respondent and do things in its name uh, and likewise uh, that the that authority was passed on to the relevant key holding porter it, it is in fact the opposite of a chain of agency <clears throat> argument as as regards the pleading so that's the pleading how did the judge deal with this just briefly to show you uh, in paragraph 60 on page 86 of the core bundle, uh, he says in the second, third line down, worth noting that claim in this case is an allegation that the, defendant, the defendants were entrusted with the keys to the claims flat, and it's an important feature of whether or not on the assumed fact that is a fair way to characterise the nature of the defendant's position. So he asks himself exactly the right question. He goes on in paragraph 69 on page 89 in the passage that Melanie Friend has just taken you to uh, to note in the second half of that paragraph claims not brought against Fairbrother, the pressure managed agent, also, the reporter's employees were FSL, uh, and that the defendant was not their employer. So he, he correctly identifies that the porters in question were employed by FSL or APSL. It, it matters not, not by the respondent. And then one finds in paragraph uh, 75 on page 91. He says, as the porter was not the defendant's agent, and in my view, clause eight of the 1984 sublease bites in any event whereby the porters are deemed to be the agents of Sonora, uh, uh, claims this is stopped from seeking to rely on any further arguments in relation to the role of the porter or agent or other party. And within paragraph 75, one can see two things. One is the judge uh, concludes, holds, that the porters were not in fact the respondent's agent, and even if that would other the position would otherwise have been different, the deeming provision would take over and displace the reality. Uh, he, he doesn't admittedly unpack, doesn't explain fully the reasoning for that conclusion, but one infers that that comes back to what we've looked at already in paragraph sixty nine, where he's identified that these employer uh, th these porters are doing, conforming their duties 
under their contract of employment with their employee, with their employer. It's worse than that, isn't it? I mean, if you left out the bit, the bit beginning with and, it would read, as the porter was not the defendant's agent, the claimant is stopped in relying, in relation to relying upon any other argument in relation to the role of the porter or agent or the other. But that's a complete non sequitur. No, no, that, that bit belongs with 8K. The real problem is he doesn't, he ought to say, as the porter was not the defendant's agent, there is no liability. Yes. And in any event. Yes. Yeah. He, he, I, I, I agree. It's uh, infelicitous. It, well, but, but buried there are two separate conclusions, not well expressed, I accept. One, of course, must um, uh, uh, be fair to the judge. This is an extemporary judgment. Not, but... not wholly. He reserved judgment for 48 hours, didn't he? No, he had his back at lunchtime the next day. And then oh, he... sorry. Next day, no. But anyway, that, that's what the judge concludes, yeah. and one infers that it, it relates to the role of Porter's employees. And he's um, finding that on agency, or rather the absence of agency, which he there um, suggests he's reached, where, where, is that reasoned anywhere? Um, my lord, no. That's why I say that one has to infer that that is the logical conclusion reached from the analysis in 69 where he establishes that the porters were the employees of FSL. Nevertheless... But that's all about the case liability, isn't it? Whether they're employers or employees. I, I, th I think that is right, but if they're going to be the agents of anyone in the circumstances where they are acting as the employees of FSL, it would be as FSL's agent rather than as the uh, respondent's agent. Uh, as I say, I don't, I don't hold that out as a, a model of uh, judgment writing in terms of the exposition of the, of the reasons that lead up to that. Nevertheless, it is clear that that's the view that the judge has taken. And, and I do want to deal with this briefly, but I do say that that's a problem for the uh, appellant. A, a ground four of their grounds of appeal, which your lordships find on page 14, Paul bundle that is. Is that the judge erred in law in deciding that the porters of the block of flats in which the flat was demised and the current was, uh, was situated were not arguably agents of the respondent for the purposes of the law of bailment. And, and that ground of appeal uh, permission has not been advanced given to challenge the judge's uh, conclusions about agency. Uh, my learned friend sought to escape that conclusion by suggesting that the ultimate question is different, whether depending on whether one looks at it through a negligence lens or a bailment lens. But, but I say it isn't. The, the, the question in both cases for bailment and negligence rooted through agency is the same. When Sebastian the porter took custody of the key, was he acting as the respondent's agent? The, the answer cannot differ or be different depending on whether one is asking the question for the purposes of reviewing the bailment claim or the negligence claim. Would that suggest that there may be something a little bit um, um, uh, difficult about the decision on um, leave to appeal, permission to appeal? Because if the answer must be the same, uh, they have leave to argue one but not the other. Well, quite. Now, I do accept that Lord Justice Popplewell um, approached it from a slightly different angle when saying no. Nevertheless, he did say no, and the ground of appeal is one which seeks to attack the judge's conclusion that the porters weren't the respondent's own agent. Uh, at the Can time. we just see exactly what the ground of appeal was? Yes, it's, it's at page, sorry, I said 14, I meant 15. So 
it's not it's not open to us to take the straightforward to take the argument well all he was doing was saying you haven't got a claim in bailment um, and the fact that this may be one of the reasons why he said that doesn't mean he can't be run on another in another context this was squarely a ground of appeal based on the fact of agency yes well, it's a collateral attack uh, on an aspect of the judge's conclusions for which permission has not been granted. So I say he doesn't get off the beaches, but but just in case, let 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 me deal with it head on. I'll start with ostensible authority at the risk uh, of teaching your lordships to suck eggs. Ostensible authority arises where a party has, by words or conduct, represented that another party, X, is his agent, and the other party relies on that representation. I'm not going to take you to it, but um, the passage in Chitty is at page 1019 of the Authority Fund book. The amended particulars of claim do not include any pleaded allegation that the respondent has expressly or impliedly represented to the appellant that the porters were its agents. Nor do they contain an allegation that the appellant relied on that representation when deciding to hand the porters, give the porters custody of her keys. Even if there had been a pleaded case, for proper factual allegations that would support the ostensible authority agency analysis, it is entirely hopeless once one brings uh, 8C and 8K of the sublease into play, they are the two provisions in the supplemental bundle at 217. I'm assuming that your lordships are, are reasonably familiar with this, but uh, uh, denying that the respondent could be liable for uh, in tort or in bailment or otherwise for the actions of the porters and, and still more explicitly at 8k which I, I take it again your lordships are familiar with in the second half of that it, it, in, uh, in the event that porters do render services to subtenants themselves, key holding etc they are deemed to be the servant of the lessee not the respondent. So, well, I'm curious to why does that? Of course, I see why that's wholly inconsistent. Yeah. But why is that inconsistent with? Since they didn't say that in terms to the claimant, wouldn't it be theoretically possible that by other conduct? Uh, they did make such a representation to the defendant. You say not pleaded. All I'm saying is referring to the contract to which the claimant was not a party wouldn't undermine a case if it otherwise existed. Well, the, the first point is, as your lordship has identified, it is not said. Um, bear in mind, it has to be, the representation has to be by the respondent itself. Yeah, I the, that. the agent can't represent, no, I am the agent. I know, I know, I know that, but sorry. You had two strings to your bow. You said no pleading. No pleading. And then you said even if it had been pleaded, it's hopeless because of these contractual provisions. Yes. I wasn't unsure why if it was pleaded, and we don't know what the pleading would have said, but it's not axiomatic that the contractual provisions would undermine a case on ostensible authority because they might not be aware of what was in the contract. Well, uh, two things. Firstly, I think I would accept your Lordship's point that I'm... Um, putting it too highly, uh, it, it is a problem for a party seeking to uh, establish 
that it has been represented, that the respondent has represented that the porters are its own agents, that in the uh, lease which empowers the respondent to cause porters to be provided, there are um, standout up in lights provisions that say they are not the respondent's agents at all. They are not deemed to be, and I am not assuming any responsibility per AC, uh, 8C, uh, and they're deemed to be the agents of someone else, not me. That would be a problem for somebody seeking to establish responsible authority. I, I can see your lordship might say, well, if the, if the representation has to be made by the respondent itself, and we don't know what sort of representation it would have been, if the respondent had said, if one imagines my conversation in the office, this time with the tenant present, uh, hand over your keys to me. I, I will look after them, come what may, and I will make it my own personal responsibility to ensure that they come safely back into your hands. You might get an argument as to whether this uh, whether the explicit yeah. conversation or if, would... if on day one a member of the management committee had come to welcome her and say let me talk you through the services the porters will provide for you on behalf of the respondent yeah oh, well absolutely that, I'm not, I'm not saying a representative of the of, of fair brothers I'm saying a representative of the management committee the, the, the managing the agent no uh no I'm saying if or a I'm saying if someone from say flat C said hello I'm the chairman of the defendant, Me. yes. Um, so nice to have you in the block. Um, this is, let me tell you what the porters will do for you. That still wouldn't do, my lord. It, it needs to be better than that, because this is all not what the porters will do for you. Sorry. It, the, this is what the porters are going to do um, in our This day. is what our committee has asked the um, porters, have agreed that the porters will do. Even that's not good enough. It has to be what they will do f on our behalf, because the whole point of ostensible authority is, has the respondent held out, not just that the porters are going to do useful things, but that they are the respondent's agent when they do so, so that everything they do is something that the respondent does itself. That's what we're looking at here. But right, you're... Yeah, okay, fair enough. I'd be, I was taking it to, if they'd said all those things... Uh, then then the fact a... that such, such, something that was contrary to what was appeared in the sublease wouldn't be fatal, because she wouldn't know what was in the sublease, except purely theoretically, which is clause 10 of the subtenancy agreement suggests that she's aware of it. Yes. It certainly wasn't. You might have a context. I, I certainly don't go along with that, because, but the whole point and the real reason why clause 10 gets discussed at all is that it, by covenanting to comply with the terms of the sublease in her own lease, yeah. in by coming to comply with the provisions of Sonora's lease in her own lease, she can't be heard to say oh, 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 that 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 is a lease that I'm not interested in. It's um, I I shouldn't be um, required to think about what it might contain. Um, I didn't look at it. Um, but I don't need to go this far. No, yeah, but my, my point way. is, it's not pleaded, and and the discussion that we're having shows how important it is for that case to be pleaded and for. Yeah. The assertions to be that that the that are said to be made by the respondent that the porters are its agents to be critically analysed. But the point is that they're, they're just not there at all. Um, and it, it may be that that is one doesn't need to go as far as saying well, even if there had been a conversation, one still comes back to H C and K. Anyway, uh, okay. my lord, I want to keep speeding along. Um, but let me let me take the alternative way of looking at things. She. Appellant could get to the same place in theory by establishing that the porters. I'm putting the heading actual authority, is that right? Yes, yep. please do. Uh, the porters were the agents, were still the respondents' agents under an unbroken chain of agency and sub agency. Um, but there are problems with that. Uh, it is well established that an agent can only delegate the ability to bind the principal if the principal expressly or impliedly assents to that happening. And that comes from uh, that principle is recorded in Chitty at page 10818. Shall we just look at that? Uh, Yes, or I can read it to you if it's it's quicker. 
Uh, I'd like to see it. I yes, um, we're 1018. So that's in the, in the um, authority bundle. What, what page? Uh, 1008 behind town. Is the paragraph number in Chitty? It's 22046. So it's the passage that you sidelined? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, delegatus non possis delegare and all that. Um, on her pleaded case, the appellant simply cannot establish an unbroken chain of authority. She does not plead that the respondent did assent to the to Fairbrother delegating its authority to bind the respondent to FSL or APSL. It's worse than that. She pleads the opposite. That's paragraph 20B on page 106, which we've already looked at. Namely, that there has been no delegation of Fairbrother's authority. Just give me the, the reference. Which power is it? In the it's part? 2 O, letter O, B, page 106. Yep. Um, she pleads the opposite, but one mustn't forget about the rest of the chain because, for the reasons that I identified when I identify my first principles, uh, one has to get all the way down the chain if, if this line of argument is to work. And the appellant doesn't plead that the respondent assented to FSL delegating its authority to one or more of its employees to bind the respondent. And furthermore, the the unbroken chain argument gets into further difficulty once we get to 2000 because whereas before under the original management agreement Fairbrother had authority to employ porters in the respondent's name they lost that authority when the old paragraph 10 of schedule 2 was subbed out in favour of the new one. So in terms of the authority to engage porters, the FSL didn't have authority to pass on to anybody else. They weren't able to, to employ porters that would become the respondent's employees, and they therefore couldn't confer that uh, that ability on anybody else. So, in, in summary, the agency case is unsustainable on the facts as pleaded. The ostensible authority case doesn't work, nor does the actual authority case work. So, if I may move on, conscious of the time, to the other way in which the appellant puts her duty of care case, which I call it a duty of care in light of the contractual scheme and all the circumstances. Trip off the tongue, but that's my heading at any rate. Um, assuming that the judge was right, that the porters weren't the respondent's agent, whether that's because Milan and friend didn't get off the beaches or because my submissions uh, have found favour as to the substance of it, the question which arises is whether a duty of care nevertheless falls to be imposed in light of the uh, contractual scheme and, and the circumstances. Uh, and, and the duty here that's being asserted is a duty on the respondent to ensure, to procure or ensure that the porters at all times perform their functions with reasonable skill and care. 
Now, there's two starting points here which are very important and which uh, my Lord identified in the course of argument. The first one here is that when deciding whether to impose a duty of care on the respondent, you need to recognise the role of the other actors in the scene. The potential candidates for the imposition of a duty of care are not only the respondent, but the freeholder and head landlord, Sonora, the appellant's own landlord, Fairbrother, the professional managing agent, pausing here, so far all of these parties received letters before action ahead of the claim that was ultimately brought against me, and also FSL, APSL, as the people who employ the porters and provide them. And then there's the porters themselves, critically, Sebastian, who took custody of the key. So just on factual question, we got the letters before action to the first three in your list. We haven't got their responses. They did all respond. I don't, we, we haven't we, got them. You haven't got them. We don't know what they said that one might then have inferred, made them think, well, we won't sue them, we'll now sue you. No, you don't. No, fair enough. I just um, wondered. Uh, although, interestingly, in all three cases, uh, the uh, appellant alleged that the porters were the agent of the freeholder, Fairbrother, and Sonora. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's not a cheap point. We don't know what they said. Yes. Um, but the legal analysis cannot change because of the accident of the appellant deciding to sue the respondent and the respondent alone. And the role of the relevant porter and his employer is of particular significance in answer to my Lord's, uh, uh, in answer to a point that my Lord made to my learned friend this morning, uh, as both the judge and Lord Justice Popplewell uh, have already acknowledged and identified the fact that the keys were handed over to the porter uh, gives rise to a claim in bailment and probably also a, an assumption of responsibility type duty of care at common law. Moreover, as the event occurred during the course of the porter's ordinary duties, the appellant has a parallel right of action against his employer, who is vicariously liable. So what we're coming on to look at now is whether anyone else assumed a responsibility for the appellant or whether it is just and reasonable to impose a duty of care on someone else. Now, I accept it's conceptually possible for more than one actor in the scene to owe a duty of care um, in respect of the performance of the porter's functions. But it is an important starting point that this is a case where the appellant already has a clear right of action against the tortfeasor and his employer, or the wrongdoer perhaps might be a better word, this is not a case where there might otherwise be what is referred to in the authorities as an unacceptable liability gap if the court is unable to find its way to impose a duty of care on the respondent as well. And one can see that the judge had that well in mind in paragraph 69, which we've already looked at twice, that this, these, the logical, the, uh, the appropriate target for the claim is the party who committed the wrongful act and the employer who stands behind him. My second preliminary point is um, uh, 
what the judge records at paragraph 43 of his judgment, which is that there had been no communications or dealings of any kind between the appellant and the respondent. Somewhat unusual. Ordinarily, in these cases, they arise specifically because the parties have come into contact with each other and in some way interacted. So if there is to be a basis for imposing a duty of care, it has to be drawn exclusively from the wider context. So what then is there to positively weigh in the balance in favour of the conclusion that the respondent has itself assumed a responsibility towards the appellant or otherwise brought itself within Caparo principles? My learned friend has identified uh, what he would like you to put in the scales in paragraph 20, 39 of his skeleton argument on page 29, uh, and also in paragraph 42. He has, of course, elaborated in the course of his oral submissions today. This is page 29 of the... Call page bundle. 29 of... At page 29, paragraph 39. And, and what he identifies in paragraphs 39 and 42, and he uh, uh, stuck to his guns in his oral submissions, are that the, the factors that you put into the balance in deciding whether there's an assumption of responsibility or borrow principles are satisfied, he, uh, what he puts in is specifically the contractual scheme which sits above the appellant. And he submits it, and he relies on the fact that the porters are pre porters' presence in the building is referable to a suite of contractual obligations of which the respondent itself forms part. That's one aspect of it. He, he couldn't quite decide in the course of his oral submissions as to whether they were there because the respondent had to ensure, procure that everybody else in the chain got them there or whether that was as a matter of simple discretion. But he's relying on the nature of the contractual scheme uh, and also the fact that the appellant was an occupier of the building and, uh, as an occupier, availed herself of the porter's services, including specifically key holding. Is that enough? Is, is it even arguably the case that those two things alone give rise to an assumption of responsibility by the respondent for the appellant or satisfy Caparo principles? And the answer to that is emphatically not. And I want to start by looking at, before we get to clause 8C and 8K, I want to look at all of the other factors uh, that come into play here. And they are firstly an ex hypothesi. Uh, the keys were entrusted to one of the porters, Sebastian, who the key was given to. Um, he was neither the respondent's employee nor his agent. I, I, I say that, my lords, because if he was the, the agent, then I'm, I'm sunk under the agency argument. But if assuming that, that I've won on the agency argument, the, gen, the circumstances and contractual scheme duty of care, I presuppose that he's not their, not their agent. So we've got porters given to someone else, not the respondent's employee, not his agent. then the, into the mix must also be thrown, as I've indicated. There's a perfectly good claim against the porter, perfectly good against claim against the uh, em, employer, uh, and they are the appropriate targets. But it goes, there's more than that. One has to uh, note that the, this duty of care, which is specifically founded upon the contractual scheme, if it's going to be rooted in the contractual scheme, including the sublease, then one has to pay proper attention to it. 
And uh, in that context, one firstly notes that the appellant is not a party to that contractual scheme. And indeed, it has notably been crafted in such a way that it doesn't confer uh, rights and benefits on sub tenants like the appellant. And one needs to look very quickly uh, at the provision, relevant provisions in the sublease, page 196 of the supplemental bundle. Here are the recitals to the 1984 sublease, which is incorporated by reference into the 1999 sublease. And recital two, the bit that I'm interested in, starts four words before the end of the page. In this lease, except where the other context otherwise requires, the reference to lease shall not include any underlease whatever the length of term or any head lease for any term uh, less than granted by this lease, and lessee shall be construed accordingly. So that when one then comes on to see the scheme of covenants, which begins on page 200, one has to bear in mind the definition of lessee. And one must also note that this is a... Um, carefully crafted scheme that takes into account all of the potential interested parties, freeholder, uh, the respondent as landlord for the purposes of the sublease, the tenant of this lease, the other flat lease tenants, they're all catered for and sees in clause uh, three that certain covenants are given with the lessor and with the company, that's me, the respondent, and with the lessees of other flats comprised in the buildings. Certain other covenants in paragraph four are uh, deliberately only enforceable by the lessor and with the company. So that the draftsman has given uh, a clear indication as to, or produced a scheme which identifies the parties who are supposed to get the benefit of these obligations, including, in some instances, um, parties who are strangers to this particular lease. And sub tenants are conceptually recognised because they are carved out in Recital 2 of the people who might otherwise benefit from the words and with the lessees of other flats. So... The answer to the question, for whose benefit are these services being provided, is Sonora and the other long leaseholders, not sub under tenants. And this is a point that the judge had well in mind, uh, just for your lordship's note, because time is marching on. He says so, uh, he makes this point at paragraphs 37, 38, and 65. It's a little bit unrealistic, isn't it? We don't know how common it was for the leaseholders under the flat leases or their successors to um, sublet, but it would be um, well surprising if it happened quite often. The, there is an alienation covenant in the. Um, yeah, but, they're allowed, but they're allowed to. They're allowed to, yes. Yeah, that's my point. Um, Given that the, I was about to say, but given that they contemplated that they can, it'd be very odd if portrait services, which were in fact supplied, were supplied differentially as between uh, uh, actual lessees uh, and their lawful and uh, other lawful residents, really, because they might even include licensees or family members. What you are looking at here, the, the, the essence of the exercise that we're doing is looking at the contractual scheme, which is the foundation of the suggestion that the duty of care is owed, looking at how the rights and obligations have been crafted, looking at who is supposed to, is supposed to be able to sue the respondent for failing to provide services, um, failing to comply with its covenants, and, and, and which people beyond the four corners of the 
parties to this lease um, get the same rights. And one can see that there has been a um, carefully instituted system which draws the line at subtenants. Okay. Uh, and it makes perfect sense because, of course, what you don't want is precisely this to happen, which is that the, the cog that sits in the middle of these this leasehold structure to be sued by somebody. And when it goes down, then so does the whole um, system that it holds in place. Uh, but anyway, do, is there an assumption of responsibility in here for the appellant? Answer no, in my respectful submission. Um, Uh, and uh, the mere fact that there are these contractual obligations between uh, the, between the respondent, fair brother, but, uh, fair brother, fair brother, and FSL, FSL for the porters, that that doesn't that doesn't assist learned friend for the reasons that I've already identified. But e even if it did, it, just imagine that the law of tort really did operate in a way that required one just to follow the chain of contractual causation until you get to the party who has set the whole thing in train. Um, I am not that person. Um, everything that the respondent does, it does pursuant to an obligation which it owes in the head lease to the freeholder to get everything done that needs to be done under the subleases. So even if this were a, a, a correct form of analysis, and I say it's not, um, the buck doesn't stop with me. So even before we get to clauses 8, C and K, I say that there is nothing that's weighing in the balance in favour of the imposition of the duty of care. Um, and, it, and actually, on closer analysis, even before we get to these two clauses, the contractual scheme rather militates against the idea that the respondent is assuming um, uh, a liability, responsibility uh, beyond the parties identified within the scheme uh, that we've just looked at. Is it relevant, or you say neutral, that the respondent is a company owned, we don't know the details, but at least in substantial part by the lessees themselves, and whose only function appears to be to service at cost, uh, provide at cost the the these the uh, common part services. Uh, I, I suppose it might be a, a, a light point in my favour. I don't I don't rest my case on it. Yeah, okay. Sorry, you were about to say about to all that before 18... you got to 8C and 8K, which really speaks for themselves, don't they? But you better make yes, it. Yes, 8C and 8K, I, I think I've taken your lordships to that. And um, uh, what one needs to do here is, is first consider the role that they play. I mean, they, they are obviously absolutely dead against the imposition of a duty of care. And in terms of the role that they play in the process, I just, there are a number of cases which one might look at, but I think I will need, I'll, I'll, I'll do it with the Galliford case, if I may. The Galliford case starts in a tab 8, page 168. Uh, tab 8. Yes, but nobody's put on the bundles which tabs are in which volume one. Very good. Just to, simply, to state the facts quite shortly, as you see from paragraph three on 169, um, if I can explain that the uh, claimant's MCL, as you see it, a little paragraph D, they are contractors under a building contract which provided for a development to be built out in accordance with designs uh, provided by MM, uh, who were uh, a separately appointed uh, engineer. 
uh, and the parties MM and MCL, the claimant and the engineer, liaise with one another about the design in the lead up to the contract. Uh, the specification was found to be uh, defective, the project was completed late, the claimant suffered losses as a result, and it sued the engineers in negligence, having no contractual relationship between them. Uh, and uh, just to show you that the uh, page uh, 251, paragraph 204, you will see that the specification, the origin of the claimant's complaint, uh, included language disclaiming responsibility to any other person other than the person by whom it was commissioned. <laughs> Last lines of the quoted paragraph. And in considering whether a duty of care was owed by the engineers to the building contractors in respect of the design, in respect of the contents of the specification, as Justice Aikenhead explains uh, their role at page 289. Uh, starting paragraph 328. And the simplest thing for me to do, bearing in mind the time, is could I invite your lordships to read paragraphs 328 and 330 to 332? Yes. Um, so the disclaimer is, plays an important part in the process of establishing whether a duty of care arises because, as Lord Devlin puts it, a man can't assume a responsibility in a document in which he says, I'm not assuming a responsibility. These are important pointers uh, that lead to the conclusion as to whether it is right to impose, whether there has been an assumption of responsibility or whether Kapara's principles are satisfied. Um, the other principle that I wanted to draw your attention to is in the uh, Macmillan case. Uh, which starts on a tab for page 30. Um, this is an insurance case where the claimants were suing a negligent insurance broker, their losses should have been covered by an insurance policy that should have been placed by another insurance broker. Um, that other insurance broker failed to do the necessary, they weren't covered and they sued him in negligence. The facts don't really matter. The bit that's important is on page uh, 42, Mr. Justice Evans, in the sideline bit at the top of the page, is considering whether uh, the duty of care would disturb the balance of legal relationships established by different contracts in this quintessentially commercial context. But what's interesting about it is the 
the way in which one tests that notion, and to see that, um, if your lordships look at the uh, last paragraph in the second column and just read to the conclusion of that paragraph, which is three lines down on the, on the next page. So it is, it is useful when testing whether against a... I'm so sorry, my lord, you saw me. Yeah. Uh, when testing whether against a contractual background, uh, if, if the question is put to the defendant, you do realise that you are assuming responsibility not just for the obvious people, but also these other people. Uh, if you would... The answer to sort of a vicious bystander, this isn't it. Um, the answer would come back, absolutely, absolutely not then that is useful. Applying those principles here um, to a contractual scheme which thus includes clauses 8c and 8k, uh, no sub-undertenant reading this lease could conclude that the respondent was assuming a responsibility for her. Uh, there are no pointers uh, uh, in her in favour of that conclusion. They all point diametrically in the opposite direction. The fact that the sublease is referred to within her own lease and she covenants to comply with its terms means that she cannot be heard to say that this is irrelevant to her. Given that Sonora has agreed not to hold responsible the respondent for the performance of the porter's functions, it, it would be strange, surprising, and I say unfair for the appellant whose title and bundle of rights comes directly from Sonora to be in a better position. She has quite literally leased Sonora's rights. Uh, how can she find herself in a better position? Or, or to try the Macmillan test, in those circumstances, if you are putting at the date of the Sonora, grant of Sonora sublease to the respondent, um, you, you have excluded liability and, and made clear you're not responsible for the porter's duties as regards the tenants to this lease. But you do, would you accept that you are res assuming a responsibility towards anyone to whom they sublet? Um, I say that that would elicit, properly elicit, uh, a particularly indignant, certainly not. So I'm um, shorn of the argument about a chain of agency, if one has to fall back on the contractual scheme and the circumstances more generally, my respectful submission, uh, there is nothing in the argument that a duty of care is owed by the respondent. It would be quite wrong to, uh, for the court to conclude that it has assumed responsibility to the appellant for the uh, uh, porter's own actions, and Caparo analysis must lead to the same place. Let me move on, unless your no, lordship has. Just one question: mm. Is the subtenant generally entitled to see their lessor's lease? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you are a common law, uh, and, and I'm not sure. In circumstances where this sublease states in terms that you are to comply with a copy. Uh, you are to comply with the terms Comments in the head lease. In the head lease. Mm -hmm. It would be a bit extraordinary if the subtenant had no entitlement to call for the document that would enable her to do that. Yes. And is it registered? I mean, is it, presumably the head lease is registered. It's a long lease. Head lease registers, so is the sub lease, um, would, not so the sub under lease. Does that mean that any member of the public, including the subtenant, can? Look at the register and get a copy of yes, it. Well, yes, well, it does. Yes, it's a publicly available document. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, may I uh, move to grounds one and two? Uh, and I'm going to deal with these quite quite shortly. Um, the first thing that I would like to make clear is what arguments were actually put to the judge and what arguments were actually not put to the judge. Um, as far as ground one is concerned, it was not my submission at any stage whether in writing or orally, uh, to the judge below, that clauses C and clause 8C and 8K were imported as a matter of contract into the sublease. Into the... Sub-underlease, sorry. Did I say the sublease? I meant sub-underlease. I never based my uh, um, submissions on the notion that clause 10 of the sub underlease meant that the provisos in clause 8 came directly down. Um, it was not my submission. You relied on them in just the way, the way you've just been doing. Yes, on the contrary, I, I founded my submissions on the fact that there's no contractual relationship between the respondent and the appellant at all. Um, I also didn't argue that they were they those provisions were enforceable by recourse to principles of privity of state at common law, or indeed by reference to the equitable principles that are referred to in Ronan Stevens. Is, is that restrictive covenants? That's restrictive covenants. The, the, covenants restrictive of use only. Yes. Yes. You don't suggest this is they're, they're not covenants. covenants. They don't say they're covenants. They don't restrict land, uh, use of land. And privity of estate and Ronan Stevens, all that is blown away by the Covenants Act in any event. But that, that, I, we don't even need to get in there. The Landlord and Tenant Covenants Act 1995 supplants all of those um, privity of estate and equitable principles, Ronan Stevens and all of that, um, in any event. But, but, but that, that just wasn't, wasn't where I was going with this. So where did these authorities come from? They are the they are the Ronan Stevens is what has been put in the supplemental skeleton argument. It wasn't even wasn't even yes, actually, I'm judgment. sorry, yes, but it wasn't hot, it wasn't hot it wasn't referred oh, to. That's that's different. At the moment I'm dealing with ground yes, one, which is okay. yep. HC and K are directly enforceable by yep, yep. the respondent again. And and that just wasn't my case. So ground one is is setting up an Aunt Sally. And, and also, in, in fairness to the judge, and then there are some slight oddities in the way he's expressed himself, uh, but he also doesn't conclude that they're directly enforceable as a matter of contract or privity of state or equity. Round two, um, that was part of my case, uh, albeit an alternative case. I, I submitted to the judge that applying standard Henderson and Caparo principles, uh, no duty of care arose, including uh, the fact that there's no chain of agency and all the matters that we've now covered. In the alternative, I advanced uh, the case that the same result could be reached by a different route, namely that as Sonora's privy, uh, the appellant was stopped by deed from contending that the porters were the respondent's agents. Contrary to the dealing provision in clause AK. Um, so that, that argument was put to the judge and indeed was accepted by the judge when seen in the, in, in the judgment, albeit that it's a, a second string to my bow, a different route home. So ground one, uh, I don't need to address you on. Uh, ground two, uh, I do, because I would, if I needed to go there, invite you to do uphold the judge on the basis that the agency argument that the appellant seeks to advance is barred by the estoppel by deed, which binds her in the same way as her um, uh, landlord Sonora. And here, that does come down to the hot good decision and which in turn refers back to Taylor and Needham. My, my learned friend took you to it but you may wish to have, have it there 
It's at page 17 of the authorities bundle. Um, and the simple point there is that the principle that is there set out is that uh, a party who derives their title from their own landlord cannot have a better right than that from he uh, uh, than he from whom he derives it. And in the middle of that passage, it would be a very odd thing in the law of a country if A could take by any form of conveyance a greater or better right than he who conveys to him. Be contrary to all principle. And the term conveyance is apt to describe um, not just a transfer of the freehold, but also a lease. Features in the Law of Property Act uh, at section 205 that a conveyance includes those, but I, I say that, that come, that's as a matter of how that term is ordinarily understood. And in any event, the uh, uh, appellant derives her title from Sonora no less than an assignee of Sonora's lease. Learned friend is, is seeking to um, restrict the principle by reference to language which isn't there. Now, of course, I accept that um, Hopgood and Brown is an assignment case, but that doesn't matter. It's the principle that somebody who derives their title uh, from the landlord can't be in a better position than that party. And I take some comfort although I don't, can, I don't say that this is uh, a slam dunk, from what is said in Woodfall in tab 19, page An assignee is stopped by the deed which is stopped his assignor. Footnote, Taylor and Needham. Um, so not only the tenants' assignees, but the sub lessees and all other persons who come in under the tenant are stopped from denying the lessor's title. And the editors of uh, Woodfall therefore plainly read the principle that is. Uh, expounded in Taylor and Needham in the way in which I do. So that seems to be confined to a estoppel from denying the lessor's title, which is a very particular doctrine. Well, yes, but uh, it, well, it, what is the estoppel you're trying to set up here? You're stopped from denying clause the deeming provision in clause 8k. You're, you're stopped from asserting that the porters are the respondents' agents in light of the clause 8k, which says that they're not. That seems a very long way from a, a stop of, of the landlord's title. It's a perfectly understandable doctrine that if you take a lease from someone, you can't say you didn't own the property. Yeah, and, and that applies... To anybody who comes in under you, but that seems to be very different from from denying. Well, I take some, my... something which has nothing to do with title at all, but is simply about who's acting as whose agent. I I, I take that point, um, my lord, and it may be yeah. I'm only introduced this as, as not a slam dunk, yes. but I, I say that 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 does that is consistent with uh, how I say you should read the broader principle in. Uh, in Hopgood, and if if the answer is that somebody who derives their title from somebody else who's a party to the deed can't be in a better position, then as a matter of logic and language, uh, one would expect the tenant to be in the same position. It's a very short point, my lords. I, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I, I would invite you to conclude that the judge was correct that that principle applies in the, just as much to a subtenant as it does to an assignee, 
But um, suppose you're against me on that. You then have to work out, well, what is the consequences of the error if it is made? Um, if one corrects x hypothesis the error, and concludes that the duty of care by reference to a chain of agency argument is not barred by an estoppel by deed, and just forget about estoppel by deed, um, on a proper analysis of the uh, assumed facts, applying ordinary principles, cleansed from the question of estoppel by deed, um, that exercise leads ine inexorably to the same overall conclusion. So even simply for the reasons you've been developing yes. up to now. Yeah. Yes, I, d I don't. I don't need a stoppel by deed. I only prayed it in aid as a fallback position. Yeah. Um, so if I've got it, great. If I don't, my negligence case is, is unaffected. Um, the respondents notice. Um, suppose this is part three. Uh, suppose. Uh, that you conclude that the judge is wrong and that some form of duty of care arises, I would invite you to uphold the summary judgment order on the alternative basis set out in my respondent's notice, the final paragraph, um, which is that the duty that was owed by the respondent was it not a duty to procure that porterage services were provided with reasonable skill and care at all times by the porters. It was instead a duty to take care in those matters which the respondent undertakes itself, namely the engagement of a suitably qualified managing agent and to the extent necessary um, uh, supervision uh, of that party. Supervision. Um, the word supervision also appears in the amended particulars of claim in the definition of the services. Yes. Um, if, if they had pleaded, failed to supervise, um, failed rather, and or the porters so that they didn't do all these things which they did wrong, would that be maintainable? If, if they had... If the pleaded case was, um, you, the respondent, uh, uh, failed to supervise your managing agent, and let us say, for the purposes of this example, were aware that they hadn't been doing what they were supposed to be doing, and that they'd been employing all sorts of unsuitable people to, to be the porters, uh, and you didn't take action in relation to that, and had you taken action in relation to that and sacked fair brother and got some proper, ensured that the new managing agent got some proper porters in, we wouldn't be where we are. Um, sure, yes, that would be a, a valid claim against me. And as we'll see in a moment, it's exactly that claim that was successfully advanced in the Nahas case, which is the case upon which the appellants relied. And, and there, the allegation was, um, the, the allegation that was made good was that there was a failure in the recruitment process uh, followed by the landlord and its managing agent in a tripartite scheme. Um, and they en ended up employing a criminal who um, nicked all the jewellery themselves. In other words, I'm saying that, in, in a sense, the particular claim started in the right place. Um, there would be, potentially, I would still say there is no duty of care, but there I can see a much better argument that the respondent has to take care to do that which is within its own control. And that duty is, of course, consistent with Clause 8K and 8C because there is a carve-out that says they're not liable for anything the port has done, uh, do, but it records that the respondent will take reasonable care in the engagement of servants, caretakers, or other employers employees or contractors for your lordship's note. That's 218 of the supplemental bundle. Um, and it is also, as I've indicated, consistent with the uh, decision in uh, Nahas, which if your lordships have already had a look at that, I won't take you through it. Um, but I'm quite happy to take you through it if you haven't had a 
my position is I have seen what both parties say it says, which seems perfectly clear. I haven't actually looked at it to check that it does say that, but I don't know whether my lords would like to see it or... I have, I have looked at it. Yes. That's I, fine. I, I, Did your lordship indicate that you have read it? You have, I have, and I, I don't need to be taken to it again. No, well, I, I, I'm content not to be. Well, I'm very grateful. Um, <clears throat> so if the appellant does a duty of care at all, it's a duty of that kind. The particulars of claim don't allege that there has been a breach of recruitment supervision, so the claim can't succeed on that basis, and it was rightly struck out. Uh, ground five is that the judge ought not to have entered the arena and ought to have left this all to the trial judge. Uh, the decision about whether to enter the arena or not is a case management decision. If you do enter the arena and you determine that there's no duty of care or no arguable basis, then that's a question of law and you're right or wrong. Uh, but if you decide, if you have to make the decision as to whether it would or wouldn't be appropriate to engage with the substance of the application at an interim uh, hearing, that's a case management, here, uh, case management decision. It's not in the bundle, but uh, and I, you know, I don't believe it is in dispute between us, but one gets that from the decision of this court in Allied Fort Insurance and Ahmed. Allied what insurance? Allied Fort Insurance. Fort, F-O-R-T. F-O-R-T. I, I do have copies, but uh, which... Um, Just give us the reference. Uh, Fort and Ahmed, 2015, EWCA Civ 841, uh, paragraph 101, uh, per the Chancellor, Sir Terence Etherton. So once you, unless that is impunable, that's a bit of a nice point. If you, it, it's hard to imagine a case where if you shouldn't have, even with the wide discretion available to you for case management decision, but you nevertheless came to the right answer on a binary question, could the appeal succeed? It's a bit odd. But anyway, you don't get there. We don't get there, but if Milan Friends is going to succeed on ground five, it is that the judge erred in the exercise of the case management decision as to whether he should leave it all to the trial judge or take it on himself. And so the question is not whether he's right or wrong, but whether it was within the reasonable range of responses. Well, surely it depends, doesn't it? Summary judgment is only suitable where the facts which might emerge trial might make a difference. Yes. And if that is the case, then the judge's decision to try and grapple with it is wrong because he should have not given summary judgment in those circumstances. And well, there's a bit of an evaluative process that goes into deciding whether that's where what territory we're in and well, he's entitled uh, to be for I mean, if, it's, if that's so, I'd be a bit surprised if that were the case, in truth. Well, my lords, uh, that, that is That's the effect of the decision, said. which is not before you. So it's, as, um, but uh, let me be clear, uh, it almost doesn't matter whether it's a right or wrong or reasonable range, because this, this is not an instance where the judge's uh, conclusions yeah. could be attacked using either lens. You, you say, you say that the points of law which you want to, which you have succeeded on and want to maintain on appeal don't depend on the facts which might emerge at trial. Yes. Well, if you're right about that, then it really doesn't really doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. Um, but if, on the other hand, Mr. Mitchell's right that it all depends on what comes out of trial, then he, the judge shouldn't have decided it. Yes. Let, let me engage with the problem in in that way. Um, as far as the facts, the facts that were relied upon were the contractual provisions in documents which the judge had, and the uh, relatively straightforward facts alleged in the particulars of claim about taking custody of the keys, and that's it. And the judge rightly twice identifies that this is a case with simple facts not likely to change. Uh, this is not was not a case, as it was in Rush Bond, 
where there are disputes about what pleaded allegations mean or what one should take, of, take from them, and the parties, the court was faced with what they referred to as spinning the pleaded allegations. None of that arose. It was straightforward facts that everybody had, was able to engage with. The only basis upon which Learned Friend says that the judge was wrong was that he, it is said that he ought to have left it for the trial judge because in the context of the direct enforceability point, there might be evidence, uh, direct enforceability and the effect of clause 10 of the sub underlies, there might be evidence about what was said to the respondent at the time and things that go towards, uh, evidence about matters that go towards ground one that would be in play. But there's a number of problems with that. Uh, one is that, that that way of putting ground five piggybacks on ground one which is for the reasons I've already indicated, is uh, misdirected because the judge didn't say that they were directly enforceable. I wasn't saying that it was directly enforceable. Um, uh, and the estoppel by deed point is a point of pure law. Either I am, am a privy or rather either the appellant is a privy or they're not a privy. Um, and the next, the next reason why that argument doesn't fly is that if further evidence about what the appellant subjectively thought was the meaning and effect of clause 10 of her sub under lease or indeed provisions in the sub lease uh, at the time she arrived. The fault for that lies with the appellant, not with the judge. Those are matters all within her own knowledge. She could have adduced evidence about those matters and she didn't. She got my skeleton argument a week before the hearing before the judge and she responded to it by putting in a supplemental skeleton and arguing out the points of law. She did not in either her supplemental skeleton below or in her oral submissions suggest to the judge that she was at a disadvantage in responding to the respondent's summary judgment application without the evidence of the kind that she refers in paragraph 49 of her appeal skeleton. This wasn't an issue. The learned friend did take the point that per rush bond, one should be careful about, uh, one should be careful about spinning and that duty of care is something that is generally better left to the trial judge. The your lordship is, is going. No, don't worry, it, I just remind myself. I seem to remember in, in the end, Lord Justice Coulson was quite careful not to be too dogmatic about it. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's paragraph it's quite, three it's of page, page 940 is, is, the, is the important bit. Uh, I'm a learner friend also takes you to uh, paragraph 41. Yes, but, but 43 says none of that is to be taken as a criticism of the current practice whereby a defendant who has a good prospect to demonstrate there's no arguable duty of care can seek to strike out the whole claim. It's perhaps a gentle warning against more speculative applications. That, that's the point. That, yeah, um, that's, that's what I... Uh, but yeah, that, that point he did make, the, the rush bond one, for, for, for yeah. what it is worth. What he didn't say is, uh, I can't fight this uh, yeah. application because I need to have evidence about the... Um, a subjective understanding in relation to the ground one point, and you, you can't criticise the judge for failing to accede to a submission that wasn't made to him. Um, so, uh, in my respectful submission, simple facts are just perfectly entitled to uh, reach the view that he could deal with it himself if it's a case management decision, or right. If it's not, it doesn't matter. Uh, in my respectful submission, you ought to uphold the judge. Yes. Uh, may I turn my back briefly? Uh, you may. Um... But I think, if only for my own education, I would, did you say you brought copies of Allied Fort with you? Yes, I did. Perhaps the... Um, uh, and I supplied... Don't, you needn't make any submissions on them, but I, I think uh, it would be just useful to see what Sir Terence really said yeah. there. 
I, I sent a copy of it to my learned friend yesterday when yes. I thought about this. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Mr. Duckworth. I'm very grateful. Yes, Mr. Well, Mitchell. Might as well have noticed from the uh, supplemental bundle how this application for summary judgment started life. And it started life um, in relation to um, a different uh, attempt to put the case. And you can see from the amended particulars of claim and how much red there is in there. I'm um, so sorry. We will, I promise. This one. Sorry, my lord. Uh, just one. Yes, I see. Okay, now, yes. I, I just want to check how I thought it was the right case, but it is. Now, keep going. All right, my lord. So, this started life as an application to strike out a former version of the particulars of claim. And the application itself, as you see when you look at the, the um, application notice, is sparse. Um, it, what it says um, in, um, on page three of the supplemental bundle, so behind tab one, There to be read, uh, and I in invite you to bear it in mind. So it was what was there on the original particulars of claim. There's a couple of points which have disappeared about the um, Contract Rights of Third Parties Act, but the main point is um, the facts alleged don't support a finding that the claimant has a duty of care. Um, now, in response to the application. Um, the um, claimant prepared the amended particulars of claim which we're looking at now. And I mean, something which I at the time thought was a tiny bit odd is that the, the, the learned judge gave permission for the amended particulars of claim, which obviously usually involves their having some prospect of success because that's the rule for amended particulars of claim. And, and the, the application to amend was uh, opposed. However, the way he did it, as he makes clear in his judgment, was to say, well, I'll let you amend, but without prejudice to the proposition that you can all be struck out anyway. So fine, fine. But the point is this, that the argument um, that was made and as reflected in the judgment, the focus was, um, as you can see from my learned friend Skeleton from the hearing below, which is page 106, of your supplemental bundle. The focus here uh, was on the contractual structure, uh, the bailment claim, um, and the estoppel by deed point. Now, before you, um, I mean, they've succeeded at first instance, and here I am with my permission to appeal. And the attack has changed again. So um, we've got some pretty ferocious criticism of the pleadings now. Um, and maybe, I mean, it, perhaps it is the case that the pleadings need yet further work. Um, I mean, I don't concede that that's the point. But what I do say is that when one is trying effectively to strike out a claim on the basis that it doesn't plead the necessary elements of a cause of action, I mean, such a thing is always curable and in fact is usually cured. Uh, so one pleading might be struck out, but unless it's utterly hopeless, the underlying facts, there's usually permission given to have another go, with costs being the, the relevant collateral issue that arises. But in this particular point, well, because we haven't had pleadings closing, there have been no part 18s. So my friend is in the luxurious position of just hurling criticisms at my pleading, which, if this application before had been refused, things would have proceeded in the ordinary way. He'd have made part 18, so I'd have answered. I'd have told him, as I have now just heard, that my client never saw the 1984 flat lease. She just never saw it. Now, that means, okay, she has, a, there's a difficulty, isn't there, about the AST, which contains the short shorthold tenancy, which contains clause 10, which refers to a document that she's never seen. These matters are not irrelevant. 
but they're being relied on against me now. Um, and my submission is that this criticism of the pleadings, and indeed the whole respondent's notice, um, which is based on the pleadings, illustrates just how premature it was to dismiss this claim, because clearly there is plenty to argue about. We've been arguing about it all day on slightly different grounds as the case and as the understanding shifts. So let's take the agency point. Now, my learning friend very fairly concedes that if it is the case um, that by a chain of agency, the man on the ground, and it would have been a man, uh, as far as we can see, was an agent directly through a chain um, of the respondent, then he's got a problem. I mean, he very fairly concedes that. Um, and he referred you to the fact that the judge had, quote, hold, held at paragraph 75 of the judgment that the porters were not the defendant's agent. Um, and he says, well, assuming I've won on agency, but actually, I mean, th there's no basis. Well, I do not understand from that judgment how the judge came to the conclusion that um, the porters were not the agents. I don't re recollect that we went through the Fair Brother Services Agreement, which I'll just quickly remind you of. Um, and if there's no reasoning on a point which appears to be determinative, um, that really is not an acceptable basis um, for my client's claim to be dismissed. Um, and, and if it really is the case, that's what the judge found, well, then I'd like to appeal that too, because I mean, that, it wasn't irre irrelevant consideration until my friend started making the point in the way that he did. But you, my point is, if this vital finding um, that these um, men were not agents was made on the basis of almost no submissions, um, apart from in the context of bailment, and produces the extraordinary result that Lord Justice Popperwell can give permission for one set of parts of the appeal, which appears to be flatly undone um, by uh, his refusal to grant permission uh, on the fourth ground. Something is wrong. And by something is wrong, what I seek to get across is that this case is not easy. I mean, you can state very simply, um, as Lord Lord Nugi did um, uh, when rephrasing my case and putting it back to me to check it, you can state my case very simply. But, of course, the closer you get to the facts, the more you have to start asking questions about the agency relationships and so on and so forth. Now, this sense that one has by having an argument about whether I'm a stop from running these points at all by what Lord Justice Popperwell said, or whether something that the judge said after not explaining himself, that um, the sense of slight confusion and anxiety is a very good reason for saying this summary judgment shouldn't have been granted. We are not there yet. We are not in a position yet of knowing what the facts are. If my pleading is inadequate, then I will seek permission to reamend. Um, but that is miles and miles away from being satisfied um, that the facts here that we've been going through with you do not disclose and cannot possibly disclose a claim. Um, on that agency point, um, I will come back to this fair brother contract, if I may. Um, at uh, tab 16, page 255 of your supplemental bundle. So to remind ourselves, the respondent had a discretion to put porters in, and it did. So it, it, made, it exercised that choice and it decided to put porters in. So having made that choice, somebody needed to deliver those porterage services. In my submission, the person that was retained as agent to do that very thing on behalf of the respondent was Fairbrother. Um, and I've taken you to the definition of management services on page 258. I've taken you to the nature of the appointment. Um, clause 3.1 and 2 on page 261. Um, 
we didn't go to the agent's obligations at pay, a paragraph clause, sorry, 5.1. Which page is that? Uh, 262, so it's, it's just the next page in the contract. Um, and I think we did look at uh, paragraph clause 15 on page 267, the alienation provision. So what, what was the point on five that you were taking us to, apart from telling us we hadn't seen it? Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that um, the agent agrees to carry out the management services diligently protect and promote the best interests of the company, comply with all reasonable directions of the company made from time to time. Um, the, the point is that it's, it's, it is doing what it's being told to do by the respondent. Here's what I want you to do. One of the things I want you to do is supply porters to this property. Schedule 2, the management services at paragraph, uh, page 271. Paragraph 6 of Schedule 2, two gives the managing agent permission to enter into agreements necessary with any cleaning, security services, engineers, contractors, or other specialist firms for the provisions of services and facilities to the property including, and then any repairs or whatever. So they have permission to use others to achieve the things which they are obliged to, to deliver. Um, if we go over the page to um, paragraphs 10 and 11, we know paragraph 10 is different. I'll go to the new paragraph 10 in a second. Paragraph 11, one of their obligations is to liaise with and supervise the porterage staff in the performance of their duties. So the undoubted agent of the respondent is undoubtedly under obligations to do these things. Now the answer which we're given to this is, ah, well, actually, because the men on the ground were employed by a third party, this chain is broken. And in my submission, that just does not follow. Uh, Fairbrother is permitted to use third parties to deliver on its obligations. It's not permitted to delegate its obligations to these third parties. It uses them as tools to do what it is doing on behalf of the respondent. That's the chain. Now, there is plenty to fight about here in terms of facts. Um, but the legal position, as I have sought to set it out, um, first of all, there is a way home for my client. And secondly, the, what the judge found, which to some extent we've moved away from in our focus on agency, but what the, the way the judge did it is not sustainable for the reasons that I sought to set out earlier on. There's just no part of that judgment, with, with the exception of the bailment part about which I respectfully no longer complain. But what I have sought to show you is that this contractual structure thing is just not relevant to my client. You know, she is not stopped by anything in there. She's not bound by any disclaimer. The fact that one might be able to look on the land registry website and pick up the lease is just is not going to be relevant in, when we're looking at, is it the case that these people assumed responsibility by actions, by putting men in the building, doing the things that we say they did. I mean, this is a much more primitive type of claim than the more complicated representation claims and words causing damage. So my lords, I um, repeat our submission that the judgment below should not stand. Um, th it's premature. Uh, there is a real case here for my client to make, and the place at which it should be made is at a trial when there have been pleadings, part 18s, whatever applications are necessary to shape the case to ensure that justice is done. But dismissing it now is far too early. Now, my lords, I don't know if I've addressed any of the, if there are points which I have not addressed which you wish to hear from me on in reply. If not, as far as 
No, as long as any of us are concerned. My Lord, I, I don't have a right of reply, but may no. I just say this, that Learned Friend's reply started with two new grounds of appeal. <laughs> the two grounds were, can I, I promise this is two minutes, the two grounds were you should upset the judge's decision because if, contrary to his actual grounds of appeal, the judge was right that the pleaded case can't succeed as it stands, what he ought to have done is to have, have cured it invited the appellant to cure it by amendment instead of striking it out. Okay, yes. That's a new ground. It wasn't, that right. point, that wasn't argued to the judge. It wasn't part of the grounds. But don't, if you're, I think you're going to restrict yourself if you're asking our indulgence. Yes. What, your first point is, uh, that's a new point. Yes, what's it's your second? New point below and here, and it's a case management decision. And the second one is that you should upset the judge's conclusions on agency, uh, which gets him over the whether he gets off the beaches point, uh, because there were inadequate reasons for his well, judgment. I think certainly on that, we've heard everything we need to hear from you, haven't we? Well, it, it's not the basis upon which the permission to appeal was sought and granted, that, uh, that it's the right decision, but it should be upset for a failure to give reasons, English and um, whatever it is, it now escapes me. Um, that, that's Emory a separate round of appeal. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm very grateful for that further indulgence. Um, you do have a right to respond, but you may not feel it necessary. All I would say, my lord, is that my case is what I say. The characterization of my case, uh, which Mr. Duckworth frequently assists, uh, attempts to assist you with, I would urge you to treat with caution. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very well. Uh, we will be uh, preserving our decision. Draft judgments will be circulated in the usual way uh, when ready. They're circulated primarily for the purpose of enabling the uh, parties to agree the terms of a consequential order, or if they can't agree them, uh, to provide short uh, uh, written submissions so that we can decide them on the papers at the same time as we hand down judgment. But they're circulated, obviously, also for the purpose of your drawing our attention to any typographical or other minor factual uh, errors. Uh, you will be very well aware of the uh, very limited uh, further circulation beyond council, uh, which uh, is justified for those purposes. Um, if you're in any doubt, have a look at the uh, uh, Council General for Wales case. Uh, but uh, breach of those obligations is a, uh, or maybe a contempt of court. Uh, thank you both very much for um, uh, uh, very well-focused arguments. Will rise if they want.